Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today on this beautiful fall morning. Um, my name is Cami Ahrens. I'm the Curator and Director of Education at the Fox Fire Museum, which is just up the road in Mountain City, Georgia. If you haven't been, now is the perfect time to go. We are a collection of over 20 historic log structures that interpret Appalachian culture and traditions. We go on history. I won't go into it right now, but if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them later. Um, but we are sponsoring a monthly lecture series, um, which is what we are here for today. We're looking at different aspects of Appalachian history, specifically um, those based in our local county. So I'm happy to introduce Dick Sinquena to talk today about the um, building of the hydroelectric power plants here and the dams and the lakes and how that impacted our county. Um, and then we'll also have a guest speaker on November 17th. We're changing the date. Typically, it's the fourth Thursday of the month, but that's due to the math. It lands on Thanksgiving, and I personally will be in the kitchen. So um, we'll be meeting the week prior on the 17th, and Carrie Thomas um, will be coming to talk to us about the Moonshine Still. Um, that will also be um, sponsored by the Raven County Historical Society. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Dick. Thank you so much for being here today. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hello. Thanks for coming out on this gorgeous day. As you can tell, this is about the hydroelectric development of this region, specifically Rabin County. But before I start, I, I think it's important to put this presentation in some kind of perspective. You see, the story of hydroelectricity up here is really the story about geography and how terrain has affected the history of Raven County. So what, what specific geographic uh, features am I gonna be talking about? First, there's Tallulah Gorge. Second, there's a 1,200 foot drop in elevation over a 26 uh, mile stretch of Tallulah River and uh, Tugelo Rivers. And third, uh, we'll be talking about a couple of waterfalls in Raven County that had a very important impact on our history. So with that said, <clears throat> let's go to the gorge. Uh, the Tallulah River carved the gorge over several millennia. It's about two miles long and nearly a thousand feet deep. The river drops an amazing 650 feet in the gorge's first half mile, and it plunges over six waterfalls. The highest is called Hurricane, at nearly 100 feet. In 1819, a David Hillhouse from Wilkes County, Georgia, visited uh, the gorge, and he wrote a description of it that was published widely throughout Georgia and actually the entire East Coast. By 1844, trails had been hacked through the wilderness uh, to, to get to the gorge, but they were all extremely difficult and dangerous. The most popular route was via Clarksville, uh, which had developed as an early summer resort. The 24-mile round trip from Clarksville took about 12 hours, but visitors wanting to stay at the gorge uh, camped out in tents. Now, tourist visits to the remote gorge became more common by the 1870s, and it was at that time that growing numbers of tourists called, called it the Niagara of the South. The, the Niagara of the South really must have been an astonishing sight back in the day. It was said that the roar of the water uh, cascading through the falls could be heard from about a mile away and it was also thought, it was also said that you could see the mist rising from the river from about a mile away. It's far different from what we have today. Now with the arrival of the railroad to Tallulah Falls in 1882, the sleepy village perched on the, uh, on the rim of uh, Tallulah Gorge became one of the most popular tourist meccas in the entire southeast. The town eventually hosted about two dozen hotels and boarding houses to cater to visitors from across the nation as well as overseas. Prosperity reigned in Tallulah Falls, but 
and there's always a but, storm clouds were on the horizon. The Chattahoochee River, just north of uh, Atlanta, was dammed in 1904 to generate electricity for the city. And about that same time, Niagara Falls was being considered uh, for a hydro hydroelectric plant. So it was widely assumed down here that the Niagara of the South would suffer the same fate. To protect the gorge, a movement was begun to make it into a state park. A committee of the Georgia legislature estimated that it would require a tract of land about 1, 000, of about 1,000 acres at an average price of $1,000 an acre. Further study was recommended to justify spending a million dollars, but as with many government studies, actually most government studies, nothing was done. So while the Georgia legislature dithered, an, an electric utility company did not. In 1909, uh, executives of Georgia Electric Light Company, a predecessor of today's Georgia Power, peered into the gorge and saw the answer to their problem. Electricity was needed to power the company's expanding streetcar system in, in, in Atlanta and the executives knew that the Tallulah River cascading into the gorge could power a hydroelectric generating station. Every kilowatt of that electricity would be transmitted to Atlanta. The company's problem was solved. Construction of Tallulah Falls Dam, I should say, the Georgia Electric Light Company purchased land on the rim of the gorge in 1909, and they spent about $109,000. Construction of the dam began in 1910, but due to the need for additional capital to finance this mammoth undertaking, uh, the company was reorganized into Georgia Railway and Power Company. In response to the environmental damage caused by the construction of the dam, the Tallulah Falls Conservation Association was formed in 1910. The association did nothing to slow <clears throat> or stop construction until Helen Dorch Longstreet took, took command of the organization in 1911. She was born in Gainesville in 1863, and she married former Confederate General James Longstreet who was second in command to uh, Robert E. Lee. They were married in 1897. She was 34, he was 76. So I guess today she would be called a trophy wife. <laughs> After he died in 1903, she launched a crusade to restore the reputation of the general who had been scapegoated for the loss of the Confederates at Gettysburg. She was right. It was Robert E. Lee's doing that caused that debacle there. But I guess, you know, diehard Confederates could never believe that Lee could do anything wrong. Longstreet's other passion at the time was protecting the environment. So she took on Georgia Railway and Power Company uh, over the dam at Tallulah Gorge. To raise funds for her campaign, she pledged her $2,600 annual salary as postmistress of Gainesville. And it bears noting that she was the first female state employee. She also took out a $5,000 bank loan and she pledging her jewelry and wedding ring as collateral. Helen Dorch Longstreet was a formidable woman. She thundered that the company was plundering, quote, the most wonderful natural asset of the Western Hemisphere. And like a biblical prophet, she intoned, the Judas Iscariots are not all underground. Some of the men who would betray the Lord for a handful of silver are doing business in Georgia today. 
would you care to have her as your enemy? <laughs> Longstreet claimed that the utility company did not own the gorge, but only the land on its rim. So according to her argument, the Georgia Railway and Power had no legal right to alter the flow of the Tallulah River through the gorge. She appealed, uh, appealed to Governor Hope Smith, who ordered a survey to determine the ownership of the gorge. It was found that 300 acres in the gorge had never been accounted for in Rabin County's original survey in, uh, in 1819. However, they were not unable to reach a conclusion about the gorge's ownership, so the governor declined to litigate the matter. Undeterred, Longstreet mounted an aggressive public uh, relations campaign to save the gorge. She succeeded in persuading the Georgia legislature to order the new governor, Joseph Brown, to bring suit against the company to determine the property rights in the gorge. The case went to trial in Raven County Superior Court in 1912, and the jury found in favor of the power company. The decision was appealed to the Georgia Supreme Court, which upheld the lower court's ruling. Georgia Railway and Power was the victor in Georgia's first environmental battle. The fight to save Tallulah Gorge was over. Tallulah Falls Dam was completed in 1913. It was considered an engineering marvel at 116 feet high and 400 feet long. And across the top of the dam, as you can see here, ran a road that was precursor precursor of today's Highway 441. Also, a 6,666-foot tunnel was blasted through solid rock that carried water from the dam's 63-acre reservoir to the bottom of the gorge to drive the turbines in the powerhouse. In September 1913, 60,000 kilowatts of electricity were transmitted to Atlanta. This made Tallulah Falls Dam the third largest hydroelectric facility in the nation. And shown here are six massive penstocks. They start, let's see, that's the end of the tunnel that I talked about. And these penstocks came down into the powerhouse, and there are six of them, and e each one powered one turbine, which drove a generator, which generated the electricity. But as Ms. Longstreet feared, the Tallulah River running through the gorge was reduced to a trickle in comparison to the raging flow before the dam was built. The taming and silencing of the Niagara of the South caused tourism to dwindle in Tallulah Falls. The final blow to the town was struck in 1921 when it was when the whole town burned to the ground. Nearly all of the hotels were destroyed and none were ever rebuilt. How did the fire start? Do they know? A, a spark in a garage. Now many in Georgia view the silencing of Tallulah Gorge as a small price to pay for technological progress. The Atlanta Constitution mirrored this attitude by shrugging, quote, to be sure, the majestic gorge of the, of the Tallulah Falls is not possessed of that glory of old days before modern progress, but the dam is a wonderful and impressive sight. The battle to save the gorge bankrupted uh, Longstreet. She lost her home, she lost her job as postmistress, and she forfeited the collateral of her jewels and wedding ring on the bank loan. She retreated to Atlantic City, New Jersey, and admitted later that she had suffered a nervous breakdown. However, she didn't stay down for long. She became an activist for women's suffrage and civil rights. And during World War II, at the age of 80, she worked as a riveter at the Bell Bomber plant in Marietta 
Rosie the Riveter. She ran an unsuccessful write-in campaign for governor in 1950, and her eventual, her eventful career ended in 1962 when she died at the age of 99. Now with the completion of the Tallulah Falls Dam, a larger vision quickly took shape. As I mentioned before, there's a 1,200 foot drop in elevation from there to there over 26 mile stretch of the Tallulah and Tugelo rivers. Uh, and this includes Rabin County, Habersham, and Stevens County. This was absolutely ideal for additional hydroelectric dams. And five more, in fact, were built between 1915 and 1926. Can you go back to the last one? What's this biggest drop? What's that one in the middle? Ma Mathis Dam. Uh, let's see. Sorry. Where am I? Okay. Now the reservoirs impounded by these dams quickly became popular recreational lakes that bolstered the tourist economy of uh, northeast Georgia. And this is Lake Burton shown here. Oops, sorry about that. What did I do? There we go. And this is That's Burton. No longer working. That's the red line on it. That's Burton Dam. Yeah, oh. At the south end of the lake. Now it also should be noted that the, the lakeshore homes that were built on all of these lakes did a nice job of bolstering the tax rolls in these <laughs> counties, particularly Reagan County, which was home to four of the dams. So for the next few minutes, I'm going to discuss each of the dams in order from north to south. But two of them, uh, I'll be spending a little bit more time on, they deserve special mention. This is Burton Dam. It was completed in 1919, and it's 120 feet high and uh, 1,100 feet across. It was not built originally to generate power. It was actually a storage and flow regulating facility for the Tallulah Falls Dam, which was about 20 miles downstream. Uh, Burton's uh, powerhouse was built uh, in 1927 and the plant had a genera generating capacity of only 6,100 kilowatts, which made it the second smallest uh, of the six hydroelectric facilities. Now construction of the Burton Dam meant that progress came at a pretty steep price, namely the destruction of the town of Burton, which uh, by the mid-1800s was the largest town in Rabin County. And shown here is a group of boys and girls standing in front of the Burton General Store. Georgia Railway and Power started acquiring the town of Burton and much of the surrounding valley in 1917. Thousands of acres were purchased and displaced families were forced to move either to higher ground in the valley, but many also went to Habersham County. It's been said that they were not paid very much for their land. But those were less litigious times than today. Can you imagine what would happen if this was to happen in 2022? I doubt if the, the dam would ever have been built. Now construction of the dam was completed in December of 1919 and the reservoir was completely filled by uh, August of uh, uh, of 1920, and the town of Burton was submerged under 2,700 acre Lake Burton. And what you see here is some wreckage that floated to the shore once the reservoir was built, uh, was, was filled. Now located south of Burton Dam is a uh, Nakuchi Dam that was built in 1926. The dam is uh, 490 feet long and it impounds 240-acre Lake Seed. 
It generated only 4,800 kilowatts, making it the smallest of the six plants on the uh, Tallulah and Tugelo rivers. Next comes Mathis Dam, completed in 19, uh, 1915. It impounds 834-acre Lake Rabin. Now this dam, like Burton, was not originally built to generate power, but rather to create a storage and flow regulating system for Tallulah Falls Dam, which was only a couple of miles downstream. Its Torora power plant was completed in 1925. And here's where the story gets interesting. Mathis's Torora power plant was not located at the site of the dam. It was built further south at the head of Tallulah Lake, which was impounded by the Tallulah Falls Dam. The location was selected to take advantage of a 190-foot drop in elevation between the two lakes. And what they did, they blasted a mile-long tunnel through a mountain to take water from Lake Rabin to the Terora power plant. And that's this, this tunnel that you see here. In 1923, two crews started blasting through the mountain from opposite sides. And miraculously, nine months later, the two teams met. I don't know what they would have done if they hadn't met. <laughs> At the south end of the tunnel, two steel penstocks or pipes not shown here, <laughs> uh, that were nine feet in diameter, 900 feet long, carried water from Lake Rabin to two 8,000 kilowatt generators. And the Torora plant entered, entered service in 1925. Yeah. Now, as previously discussed, the Tallulah Falls Dam was completed in 1913 and it generated 60,000 kilowatts of electricity. It was the largest output by far of the six hydroelectric facilities. Shown here, well, sorry. Next is Tugelo, two miles downstream from Tallulah Falls Dam, where the confluence of the Tallulah and Tugelo River uh, the Tallulah and Chattahoochee Rivers form the Tugelo River. It impounds 597-acre Lake Tugelo. Construction of the dam started in 1917, but it was interrupted by World War I. So consequently, the dam was not completed until 1923. It's the second largest output of the six dams, generating about 45,000 kilowatts of electricity. Finally, there's Yona Dam that was completed in 1925. It's three miles downstream from Tugelo Dam. It impounds Lake Yona. The facility's original three generators, which have a total capacity of 22,500 kilowatts, are still in use today. Now, these six hydroelectric facilities are still used by Georgia Power particularly during periods of peak uh, demand during summer months. They're capable of producing 166,000 kilowatts of electricity, or enough to power about 100,000 homes annually. Now, it's important to remember that not a single kilowatt of the power generated by these six facilities served Rabin County or anywhere else in Northeast Georgia. Every kilowatt went to Atlanta. It took a mountain man from Tiger to electrify this area, not Georgia Power. Thomas E. Rome, pictured here, was not an electrical engineer. In fact, he had very little <coughs> formal education. But that didn't stop him from engineering and building a hydroelectric system that brought power to Clayton. Rohn established Clayton Light and Water Works Company in 1908. And through the company, the untutored Rohn 
built a tiny hydroelectric plant pictured here at the base of a small waterfall on Stokoa Creek, a few miles south of Clayton. We don't know the exact output of this facility, but it surely couldn't have been more than a few hundred kilowatts. By 1914, the year after the Tallulah Falls Dam started generating electricity for Atlanta, Rome's powerhouse entered service. You can see in this photo the poles strung from, the, from his plant to downtown Clayton. And you can see the power lines here. It, it, uh, he electrified about 50 businesses and residences in the town. Clayton was on the grid. Now the hotels that lined Main Street at that time were a main beneficiary of Rome's electricity. Pictured here is the old Blue Ridge Hotel with a power pole <coughs> out front. Having electric lights became a major selling point for hotels and their advertising. Now, as an aside, the other big thing at this time, uh, the other big selling point was the installation of waterworks, meaning indoor plumbing. So there was no longer a need for chamber pots or trips outside. Roan sold his company to Georgia Power in 1928. And the Clayton Tribune wrote, Mr. Roan began the service here some 15 years ago as a pioneer. He deserves a great deal of credit for his initiative in the matter of giving Clayton light and power when it was so much in need of it. Now it's worth noting that Ray, uh, Roan did not limit his entrepreneurial pursuits to electricity. He purchased Rabin Telephone and Electric Company in 1918 which provided uh, telephone service to Clayton businesses and residences. To improve the service, he and Charles Cannon constructed a new telephone exchange on East Savannah Street in 1924. That building now houses the White Birch Inn. Roan sold the company in 1927 to Western North Carolina uh, Telephone Company, which was a subsidiary of the Bell Telephone System. Now, Dillard didn't want to be left behind Clayton when it came to electricity. So in September of 1928, a group of Dillard citizens was formed to build a hydroelectric facility to serve their town as well as the surrounding areas of northeastern Rabin County. The dam and powerhouse was built on Estatoa Falls on Mud Creek, several miles east of Dillard. Electricity started flowing in 1929. Now everything about Estatoa facility was minuscule. It generated only 240 kilowatts of electricity, which is enough for about two households today. It was a masonry dam. It was only 12 feet high, 50 feet long, and it impounded not a reservoir, a pond. The powerhouse told 400 square feet, which was enough to uh, house its, its single turbine and generator. The Estatoa facility was sold uh, to Georgia Power in 1960, which continued to operate the plant for some reason for 55 more years. This is the tiny powerhouse. Mm. It was taken out of service in 2015 since the facility was more of a novelty than a cost-effective source of electricity. Now Clayton and Dillard were the exception and not the rule when it came to electrification in Rabin County. Rural areas of the county, as well as throughout Northeast Georgia, remained without electricity for decades to come. To bring electricity to rural America, New Deal legislation in 1936 established the Rural Electrification Agency, or REA, to loan money to cooperatives to run power lines into rural areas. Founded in 1938, Habersham Electric Membership Co-op 
was founded by the IREA to bring electricity to Habersham, Raven Hall, White Stevens, and Lumpkin counties. My house still gets electricity from Habersham EMC. Now, despite the progress made by the REA, it was years before Northeast Georgia was completely electrified. In 1972, power lines were finally extended to Tate City, just over the line in, in Towns County. So despite all of the hydroelectric development of this region and, uh, and the REA, it really wasn't all that long ago when candles, kerosene lanterns, and lightning bugs lit the night in this region. And that, I thank you. Oh, great.